welcome to our Monday Thursday video service. Now, Monday Thursday has not gotten as much publicity over the years as Good Friday, but it plays a powerful role in this Passion Week that we're currently in the midst of. Mondi comes from the Latin word mandatum, which we get mandate or commandment from. And it's reflective of Jesus' words when he says, I give you a new commandment at the Last Supper. You know, this event really kicks off the final acts of Jesus in his death, burial, and bodily resurrection. And it's uh, really the beginning of the end for Jesus. It, it's tonight when we remember and we celebrate Jesus washing the disciples' feet at the Last Supper in the upper room and eating that meal with him and the beginning of the betrayal of Jesus um, by Judas as he leaves to go and get paid. These acts have become powerful symbols for the past 2,000 years for people of faith. Symbols. They're ripe with meaning. You know, we have some new emerging symbols in this season of coronavirus. You know, these used to represent hospitals and doctors and surgery centers, and, and now they represent uh, a tire to go to the grocery store. Earlier this week, I, I had to run to get some essentials at the grocery store, and, and everybody around me pretty much was wearing one of these masks, and of course now I've joined them and I'm wearing them, but they're all over grocery stores. You know, our new heroes, they should have been all along, uh, but our new heroes are scientists and doctors and politicians who are really fighting uh, for our fellow people. Uh, they're not entertainers or sports stars or other people we used to kind of worship, um, but they're important people and do important things. And God has been using symbols for a long time as well to help us. In the early years, God's people uh, had symbols of rock monuments and meals and animals and, and many other reminders to get his point across. Now this Monday Thursday, we come to possibly the greatest reminder ever. It's a new symbol that's coming out of an old one. An old meeting now brought to life and expanded for the whole world. And kind of like a new meaning behind the masks that so many of us are wearing now. Now Matthew 26 sets the scene for us. Starting in verse 17, it reads this. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him the teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. Now we have to go back in time even further to the institution of this symbol, this tradition, this command of the book of Exodus. I want to read several verses for you of the story where the Passover or the, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread came from. It's in the book of Exodus chapter 12, starting in verse 1. It says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the fourteenth day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood, put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over that fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals. I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you in the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything when yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly. And, and another one on the seventh day. 
Do no work at all on these days except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. Celebrate the feast of unleavened bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Now this first Passover was when God rescued his people out of Egypt by passing over them on the way to destroy. In case you weren't aware, God is a God of justice. There is a day, and there have already been days, where God's wrath is poured out on sin and sinners. Now, it's hard for many of us to reconcile this with God's attribute of love. It's absolutely certain, though, in Scripture that God is a God of both. It's why we continue to celebrate Easter, because Jesus came to rescue us, the entire earth, from the coming wrath of God. So they ate the meal in high expectation and with great obedience because they knew that it was coming quickly. For the nation of Israel in Exodus chapter 12, they knew that God's deliverance was coming that night as God was going to deliver justice to Egypt. For the disciples, Jesus was preparing them to recognize that Jesus was coming in a whole new way and a new lasting covenant to his people. Do you ever fall into the trap of thinking that God isn't coming? He really isn't going to come through for you or for us. Our expectation begins to fade. But God was going to do something, both for the nation of Israel and for the disciples and for us today. God was going to come through in the worst of circumstances. And God is going to come through for us as well. If we turn our attention back to Matthew, starting in Matthew 26, verse 19. It says, So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And and while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as, as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. Now while they were eating, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now these verses highlight something. Uh, that's significant about what Jesus was doing here. You know, the difference between the first Passover and this new Passover with his disciples is somewhat hidden. But starting in verse 26, Jesus says, Take, eat. This is my body. This is not the body of a lamb anymore. Jesus was instituting something for you and for me along with his disciples. In verse 28, it says, For this is my blood. No longer the blood of these innocent lambs and goats that were to be spread over the door frames of their houses. Jesus was providing a way of escape for all of us. It was not the blood of a lamb sprinkled on a door for one person. It was the blood of the lamb poured out for the entire world once and for all. Poured out for you. So tonight, as the family of God at LifeBridge, we are encouraging you to stop and remember this meal. Now, you can go all out and prepare the entire meal as a way to remember. You can Google the recipes and you can go for it. But you can also do it more simply. Remember, the Lord doesn't look at things the way we do. We look at the outward and Scripture tells us that God looks at the inside, at the heart. And that's what's the most important. So we eat to remember. We remember what God has done for His people in the past. We remember what God is doing for his people and all people in the world today. We also remember that God is doing something for us in the future as well. That's why he includes this invitation to eat with him at this meal in eternity one day in its fullness. But did you miss it? It's not just the what Jesus did at this meal 
and now he asks us to do this in remembrance of him. It, it's also the how. So as you're doing the what tonight, in remembering Jesus by participating in communion with a, a piece of bread and, and hopefully some type of juice or drink, it, it's the how that I want to invite you into tonight. Matthew 26, 20 says it. It says, when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12. He was getting ready to be betrayed. He was getting ready to stand trial. He was getting ready to be beaten and mocked and abandoned and crucified all within a few short hours. And he was reclining. No, he wasn't pacing. <laughs> he wasn't stressing. He wasn't thinking and thinking and overthinking. He wasn't just praying, although he was going to be doing that in the garden shortly. Jesus was reclining at the table with his friends and with his betrayer. Don't overlook this. Jesus wasn't a superhuman. He was 100% man. But he had a deep trust in his humanness in his Father that led him to have the ability to recline in this most desperate and dramatic of moments. I want to extend to you an invitation tonight, whether you're alone or with a loved one or with a family. I want to in extend an invitation for you to recline. Not in the what you're doing, but in the how you're doing it. My prayer is that God will lead you to recline in this season of coronavirus, in this season of uncertainty, in this season of Easter, to recline with Jesus.